I'm Ryan Szymanski, curator for Battleship New Jersey Museum and Memorial, and today we've got another Pictures Worth a Thousand Words video for you guys. Uh, these videos have been getting pretty decent traction, and I've been getting a lot of pictures uh, sent over to my Facebook page. Uh, there's a link in the description below for that um, if you'd like to join up there. It's just easier to send pictures on Facebook than it is in the YouTube comments. Uh, so we picked another one today, this one from the Vietnam era deployment that highlights some of our aircraft. Uh, well, not our aircraft, but some of the aircraft operations on the ship. So uh, we're gonna go through this picture, see what uh, some cool stuff is in it. This is a much more uh, close up picture than the other ones we've done. And uh, talk about it for a few minutes. And remember, if, if you've got a cool picture of the ship, and uh, you want us to talk about it in a future video, we've been putting out about one of these a week or a couple times a month. So uh, feel free to check the description, uh, check the link in the description below to go over there and uh, shoot me a picture. So uh, today's picture was taken in May of 68, which would place it, uh, New Jersey would still be on the East Coast uh, she's probably doing shakedowns and things like that, training uh, prior to her uh, September of 68 deployment to Vietnam. And uh, in this picture, we see a Sea King helicopter about to land on the fantail. So let's take a look at that and see what we're working with. So uh, first off, the thing that catches my eye here is the aviation crane. That is a World War II era thing for handling the float planes, which would have been in roughly the same place as the flight deck here. Uh, most of the time when you see the ship in World War II or Korea, the crane is oriented over what is now the flight deck. During Vietnam, we always see the crane hanging out over the stern, uh, and that is to facilitate flight operations. As you can see, as the helicopter's coming in here, if the crane was over the flight deck, that just wouldn't work. So they keep it out over the stern. Well, why do they even keep the crane at all? In the 80s, they delete it. It is for the ship's boats. Iowa-class battleships were originally supposed to have a pair of boat cranes uh, between the two funnels, and that's where the boats would be stored, which is very similar to older-style battleships. As you guys know, during World War II, these uh, facilities were deleted while the ship was under construction. And uh, in wartime, you don't carry a bunch of wooden boats. And in their place, that big triple stack uh, 40 millimeter gun position was added between the funnels. Um, so in the post-war era, they kept the boats on the fantail on rolling carts that could be uh, wheeled out of the way. If the gun was firing to starboard, they could wheel the boats to port. And then when they needed to deploy the boats, they wheel it back under the aviation crane and pick it up. They even uh, most likely had a mule on board. We know they had one in the 80s. A uh, mule is a uh, piece of yellow gear. It's basically a, a golf cart or a tram sort of thing that uh, can tow stuff around the flight deck. Aircraft carriers tend to have a fair number of them. And it's likely the battleship had one, although it's not impossible to move these with manpower. Our boats in the 80s were about 17,000 pounds each, uh, which is about eight and a half tons. Uh, but on rolling carts, that's fine. And this image is cool because in the bottom right corner, those two weird uh, girder structures you see are the rolling carts for, for two of the ship's boats. And obviously the boats are not being carried right now or they are deployed. Uh, so those are the boat carts. Battleship New Jersey is the only battleship that has one of those. We do not have an original, but uh, we had the Mahan Foundation collection make us a replica that's uh, pretty similar, and it is what holds our captain's gig on the fantail right now. So if you're interested in seeing something like that in person, Battleship New Jersey is the only museum ship to see it on as far as I know, uh, and I've been to most of them. Uh, so uh, the crane, that, that's why they retain it at this point. 
In the 1980s, with flight operations becoming an even bigger part of the ship's career, with uh, more flight control facilities and everything else added, they end up deleting the crane entirely and converting the crane control room into a Nixie towed anti-submarine array uh, deployment area. So they put what's known as the boat boom on the port side at the extreme aft end of the superstructure on the opposite side from the refueling boom. In Vietnam, uh, the more a store restoration, they have not done that yet, as you can see by the crane. All right, what are some other things looking here? Uh, you can see that the helicopter is coming in from the port side of the ship. Notice the meatball on the uh, landing pad, the, the circle there. And notice how it's got a line going through it um, side to side. That line is what helicopters are supposed to line up on. Typically, what would be the easiest way to land would be to come from dead astern and just come right up, match the ship's speed, and then slowly lower yourself down. Um, you can't do that because the crane is there. So they have the uh, landing zone going cross deck, which is more difficult. The helicopter has to come in while also strafing to the side to match the ship's own speed. Now, fortunately, in this picture, you can tell from the wake that the ship isn't going that fast. But it is interesting to see that visible wake. And outside of the wake, you can see some white caps from the, the waves. Um, actually, since we're talking about aviation handling, the old float planes were supposed to land in the wake. And you can see how that's a smooth patch behind the ship that, that's uh, pretty visible. So that is the runway for the float planes, and they would taxi up under the crane to be picked up and put back on the flight deck. Obviously not an issue with the helicopters. So uh, there you are across deck. In the 1980s, if you look at pictures, first you'll see a diagonal line in the early 80s pictures uh, going from the starboard aft end uh, of the flight deck towards the port forward end. Helicopters were supposed to land diagonally, um, and that just kept them out of the way of the flagstaff at the fantail. Uh, that, that was overly complicated. And you don't fly a flag from the fantail when the ship is underway. You shift it to the uh, mainmast. So, pretty early on in the 80s, they switch over to a, a true uh, landing from a stern uh, flight pattern, and you see the line on the flight deck change. And how do they accomplish this? Well, the flagpole is collapsible. It's got a hinge on it. So when the ship was underway, both the jack staff at the bow and the flag staff at the fantail would be hinged down, and then there's nothing in the way. The helicopter can come right up the stern and land the easiest way. Uh, interestingly, if you come and visit the ship today on our flight deck, and we have talked about this in a previous video, you can find the old uh, lights mounted in the fantail for the diagonal landing. Now, interestingly, if we blow this picture up uh, on the fantail, uh, it looks like a relatively solid deck. I've got no evidence of lights being set in there at all. Uh, of course, we can't find this out via archaeology because in the 80s they build a new flight deck over the fantail uh, that has a slightly bigger footprint than this one. Um, however, you can see zero evidence of uh, any lighting or anything there to, to help with landing. All right, that's a fair amount about aviation. Um, that Sea King helicopter there is not embarked on uh, New Jersey, uh, HS-3, the Tridents, uh, so that would have been on the aircraft carrier Randall in 1968, but likely Randall is in port if the ship's operating uh, off the Virginia Capes like she should be for a shakedown cruise, then that would put, uh, and the helicopter's probably just operating off of land base doing some training of their own. 
So coming in to do a flight deck landing, pilots have to uh, maintain a certain number of flight hours, a certain number of takeoffs and touchdowns and other things like that to remain uh, qualified in uh, a given time period. So that's probably what's going on there. They're probably training the crew for flight deck ops. Let's see. Um, you can see that the nets, the railings, the lifelines around the flight deck are in the down position. They, they've been folded down so they don't uh, catch on the helicopter or anything like that as it's coming into land. But they still provide some netting. If somebody walks off the edge of the flight deck, they fall into the nets instead of into the ocean. Uh, that feature is common on contemporary vessels and uh, was used on New Jersey for the rest of her career. Uh... All right, looking at the deck, we see a lot of little black patches there. Some of it could be random uh, water drops, but uh, I'm betting a fair amount of this is damage to the deck. They, they did some work patching the deck, but they didn't replace the whole deck uh, for money saving off Vietnam, uh, or in the 80s for that matter. So... We could be seeing some deterioration on the deck here. It doesn't really blow up enough to get a good view, but it would not surprise me. Now, uh, another interesting thing, look at all of the uh, crews crouching around the flight deck. Notice there's one guy on the extreme aft starboard edge of the flight deck uh, who's got a very contraposto pose going on. Uh, he's probably the landing signals officer uh, bringing the helicopter in to land. We can tell from the silhouette of the helicopter on the flight deck that it seems to be coming in pretty straight on that line, uh, which doesn't surprise me. The, these uh, combat aviators from the Vietnam War had a tremendous amount of, of flight experience, and they could do some amazing things with their helicopters. So, so landing cross deck on a battleship with, with a huge flight deck like this is nothing at all. Looking around, the other guys at the forward starboard edge of the flight deck are wearing their cranials, their, their uh, flight helmets there. So they're probably part of the flight deck crew. Um, if you look, there's another pair of guys on the uh, port side center around that big uh, mushroom ventilator. They have, you can see, a fire hose trailing off if you follow that fire hose uh, towards the bottom right-hand side of the image, you'll see there is a uh, silver Michelin man at the other end of that hose. And I might be seeing two of them here. I bet uh, those guys are wearing their uh, fireproof outfits, possibly still asbestos at this time point. Um, but they're, they're wearing fireproof outfits here. Uh, so they're the guys who, if there is a crash or an accident during landing, they can rush in there right away. You've got the guys with the fire hose ready to rush in there right away. Um, during flight operations, they would make an announcement over the 1MC and uh, call away a uh, party of sailors to be ready to go if there was some incident. Flight crash, even with these well-trained guys, uh, s still uh, is a risk during landings on a ship that's moving, pitching, and rolling. Uh, so you can see that these guys are ready to go if needed. We've got zero evidence that there were every, ever any uh, issues on landing on the battleship in either Vietnam or the 80s, but these guys were always ready to go. Uh, there was also a flight crash locker installed in the after part of the superstructure, uh, in addition to our other repair lockers, so one specifically for flight crash and rescue. Uh, so. They, they were ready for those sorts of issues to come up. Let's see. Uh, well, that's cool. If you look at the foot of the landing signals officer, who I think is the landing signals officer on the fantail on the starboard side of the ship, the uh, top left side of the picture, you can see what looks like a small gangway. I bet that's a ladder that can be set up to the access way of the helicopter once it lands. And uh, if you look just aft of turret three, there is a small structure there. That was the film projection booth added in the 50s. 
Um, and just forward of that, you can see a little, almost looks like a scaffolding. Um, not quite sure what that structure is. If it's for maintenance and just happens to be sitting there or whatnot. Um, huh. And then, interestingly, scrolling down towards the bottom, uh, you can see that there is some sort of, uh, I wanted to call it a tripod, but it has five legs. I'm not quite sure what you would call that. It's not a quadruped. A, s a what? A yeah, a syncopod or a pentapod. Who knows? Um, some sort of structure mounted there. I'm not familiar with that either. Uh, there are tripod type structures mounted on top of the turrets that are used for underway replenishment. This does not appear like any of those that I'm familiar with. Uh, you can see there's a real heavy duty cable under, it looks like a wire cable. Um, so I'm not sure what that's for. And, and you just have two guys uh, standing there doing sightseeing. Or, excuse me, sitting on top of the turret doing sightseeing. So that's pretty cool. Um, oh, there's another interesting feature. If you look near where those rolling dollies for the boats are, off the starboard side of the ship, so about the, the left-hand side going over the edge, you see two whiskers sticking out. Those are probably antennas of some sort. Notice that just like the railing for the flight deck, they also fold down so they don't obstruct flight ops. Installing antennas on the Iowa-class battleships was massively difficult. Uh, during World War II, they had a certain number that were added, um, and that was about as much as they could take. So in Vietnam in the 1980s, when they're updating the ship with more modern electronics, they had to find places to put all of these antennas, and it was real difficult uh, because even though it's a battleship-sized ship, uh, th there isn't a whole heck of a lot of room in the superstructure. And when these radars are transmitting and radiating, they can interfere with each other. So you have issues with putting a radio antenna right next to a radar antenna. Uh, so like the ship's masts covered with antennas, there's no room for anything else. Uh, the forward part of the superstructure, the biggest um, superstructure, is also in that arc of the uh, radars, so it's not a great place to put these antennas. So you see them just like putting them on the edge of the ship and the edge of the superstructure and all over the place wherever they can. Uh, and I'm not familiar with uh, antennas being down there in Vietnam, but it appears that they are. I've just never seen them. They're, they're not that large. Uh, so the, this is very much a ship in change both throughout her entire career and in this picture um, so that's always something to keep in mind when you're doing this sort of archaeology and, and reviewing uh, the the pictures remember blueprints are great but a plan is just a plan i never trust a blueprint alone so it's great to go to pictures like this and see what actually was done and shows up on the ship so uh there are my thousand plus words on this picture of flight operations in May of 1968 before the ship deploys to Vietnam. Uh, again, we're, we're doing these videos a couple times a month. Um, there's a link in the description to my Facebook page. If you'd like to head over there, uh, you can shoot me a message and drop more pictures like this one in there and uh, we'll get to it sooner or later. Otherwise, if you have any other questions or comments about this one, you can drop them in the YouTube comment section here, or you can head over to the Facebook page and ask me directly. There are too many comments on the YouTube channel for me to get to all of them, uh, but if you go over to the Facebook page, so far I've been able to keep up with those. It might take a couple of days. I do take days off every now and again. Um, so link in the description down below. Otherwise, Battleship New Jersey receives operating support from the New Jersey Department of State also from a number of other businesses and private individuals like yourselves who really appreciate your support. And there's also a link in the description below for ways you can donate to help the museum out. You can also support us by liking, sharing, and subscribing so more people find out about the museum and our channel. Thanks for watching.